So we're here at the Cooper's Ferry site. This is week four, and we're in the area of Area B. And this week, we've finally gotten to the point where we can excavate as archaeologists should, using our trowels and shovels and moving through sediment that doesn't have so many rocks. It's not so rough and difficult for us to work on. And the process of getting to this stage has been a rough one. We've had to use big pieces of equipment that is excavating machines. We've had to uh, go through and remove a whole bunch of material that would fill lots of dump trucks. And so today I want to talk about all these deposits that we had to remove and why they're not that meaningful to what we have to achieve here in terms of our archaeological research. And in the process, you're going to learn something about the stratigraphy of Cooper's Ferry and how the site is formed through time. The Cooper's Ferry site is made up of a lot of different deposits that accumulated through time. And the most recent stuff actually would sit on top of this surface. This is the modern surface. So archaeologists and geologists use a concept called the law of superposition. And this simply states that in an intact sequence of layers, the things that are on the top are younger than the things that are deeply buried underneath them. As we go down, we're going deeper into time, and we can start to unravel the whole history of how the Cooper's Ferry site accumulated. So in this wall here in front of me, we've got two different deposits. One on top is more of a gravelly deposit that's got bigger rocks mixed in with some finer sediment. Below this, we have a lot of other finer sediments that are somewhat homogeneous, but there is a little bit of swirling of different deposits in them. From what we know about the history in the 20th century of the Cooper's Ferry site, in the late 1980s, there was a large amount of gravel dumped on top of the edge of the Cooper's Ferry site, partly to protect it from erosion, but also to protect it from people who wanted to dig for artifacts. So in this profile, you can see the pre 1980s surface and on top of it is gravel, but it's not just plain old gravel. There actually are some differences. So in this deposit, we have sort of a coarser, big gravel that's rock on rock. On top of it, we've got a pale, kind of a silty clay gravel that is a little finer and it lays this way. On top of this, we have a darker gravel that actually goes on top of it and extends this way. So what we actually have, I think, is the record that's created as a dump truck comes in and deposits one layer of gravel, then it puts another layer of gravel on top of it, and then another layer. And it successfully moves the gravel deposit out, out, out toward the river in this direction. So this deposit that's in shadow is part of the stuff that's pre-1980s, I think. Uh, and the reason why I suspect that is it's poorly sorted, it's got lots of angular road gravel, and it also contains some really telltale artifacts. It's got Shasta pop cans from the 1960s with pull tabs. It's got beer bottles, beer cans, uh, food cans, it's got fishing line. And what we can do with this is we can actually trace the edge of it as it proceeds across our stratigraphic profile here. And it goes this way comes back up, and then dips down again. So this area right here, I suspect, is actually part of a trench. And given what we know about the history of work at the site, I highly suspect this is B. Robert Butler's trench. The trench itself appears to be infilled with a lot of different mixed kinds of sediments, which is pretty typical of when you push dirt back into a hole. We also see there are some vertical edges there's a sort of a flat bottom that goes across, and on the far side, there's another rough vertical edge. So my trowel is tracing the edge of what looks like sort of a rough vertical line that transitions between more mixed deposits. You can see these layers of different colors that are discontinuous and swirly to the other side, which includes two deposits that are not nearly as mixed up at all. In fact, this one and this one look exactly like the deposits that the students are excavating in right now. And these represent floodplain deposits that we have a radiocarbon date associated with them of 6,000 years. So in this profile, we can see 
the archaeological record that moves from modern surface with gravels into materials that were pushed here, I believe, during the 1930s, during road construction that occurred along the Salmon River. And then below this, roughly in a line about right here, we get into more undisturbed floodplain or as moving water deposits. And roughly at this boundary, we have a truncation of the archaeological record. So this deposit is closer to 6,000 years and right up here is 1930s. So we've lost about 6,000 years of time in here due to road construction. So in sequence, from youngest to oldest materials, the very top of the Cooper's Ferry site has gravels that were laid down in the 1980s with a dump truck. Beneath that, we have finer sediments of dirt and rocks that were pushed onto the site during the 1930s and 1970s. And then Butler's Trench cuts through these 1930s to 1970s deposits, penetrating into the oldest materials at the site that appear to begin accumulating sometime perhaps at the end of the last ice age up to about 6,000 years ago. So our week has moved along nicely with removing a lot of this really big rock with mechanized excavation equipment that's gotten us past the 20th century and is allowing us to get back to work excavating into the deposits that are thousands of years old and getting us closer to our goal of understanding more about the earliest inhabitants of the Cooper's Ferry site.